uh, we're now about to hear uh, from two speakers with uh, deep professional expertise in, uh, in the, the submarine business. Uh, uh, Vice Admiral Charles-Henri Duchet uh, uh, is going to speak on uh, French strategy for submarines. Uh, the Admiral is the Admiral in re responsible for international relations and partnerships with the French Navy. Uh, he volunteered in uh, 1985 for the submarine forces and has served on a number of uh, French submarines over his career. Uh, in the Sapphire as the, uh, the fifth officer before being appointed commanding officer of the Panther. Um, he's also served for four years as chief of the ASW department and operations officer on the SSN's Ruby and Amethyst. Uh, the Admiral has a degree in atomic engineering, uh, and has also been the navigation officer on the helicopter carrier, the Jean d'Arc. Uh, he was appointed uh, commanding officer of the SSS Amethyst, SSN Amethyst in June of 1996, uh, and has also been executive officer on the Indomptable and the Inflexible. Promoted Rear Admiral on the 1st of September 2010, he was appointed territory assistant to the commander of the Atlantic Maritime Region. He took up his current position with the Naval Staff of Admiral International Relations and Partnerships in December of 2012 and was promoted Vice Admiral on the 1st of September 2013. Our second speaker is going to be Colonel Nong Bun Ken, uh, who is uh, going to talk on submarine rescue, a Singaporean perspective. The Colonel is commander of 171 Squadron, the submarine squadron of the Republic of Singapore Navy. Uh, he's also spent uh, many years in various uh, postings uh, at sea uh, and ashore, uh, spending his early years on the RSS Vigor, a missile corvette. In 1996, the colonel was uh, selected to join the submarine training program uh, in Sweden and began his career as a submariner. He returned as the operations officer of the RSN's first submarine, the RSS Conqueror, in 2000. He's also assumed command of the RSS Chieftain in 2002. Uh, he has a business degree from the Nanyang uh, uh, Technological University and has had a number of senior staff appointments, including Deputy Head of Naval Operations and Head Naval Underwater Warfare Centre. The Colonel took command of the submarine squadron in 2011. I think it's been interesting how much discussion over the course of the uh, uh, day has actually focused on submarine rescue. I observe the minister made the comment that uh, submarine rescue was at the forefront of his thinking about uh, the submarine capabilities. So it's very useful that the colonel will talk to us on a Singaporean perspective on submarine rescue. But uh, for the moment, would you please uh, welcome to the podium Vice Admiral uh, Duchet. I'm not in a very good situation, not uh, so, not very, not very far from the lunch. I speak just after Admiral Sawyer, brilliant, brilliant presentation. My English is not as good as yours. I'm not uh, English native, but I'm a half uh, Norman native. <laughs> and I just want to mention that it is a pity that uh, William, the, you have lost the very good accent of William the Conqueror. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I would like to, to thank uh, a lot uh, ASPI to welcome, he, to welcome me here because that's a good opportunity for the already old submariner I am to exchange with so many experts about submarines. A lot of things uh, have been said this morning but, and this afternoon, but I will just uh, insist again about the role of a submarine force to begin. Submarines are expensive military assets, difficult to maintain, uncomfortable to live in, ultimately dangerous to operate. Nevertheless, the world's navies that count are having to make serious choices to keep their submarine forces. And those wanting to count are having to do likewise to develop their capa this capability. Why? It is not a question of prestige or status. 
No, I think the explanation for the current demand for submarines draws from both historical and current lessons. Firstly, historical. Since its, adv its advent, the submarine has been a formidable mean of pressure with its capacity for stealth and the ability to be anywhere or nowhere, making it a serious threat. Countering this threat effectively places a heavy demand on an adversary's assets and is very costly. If the submarine is itself by nature expensive, it is certainly less than to combine cost of the means required to efficiently, efficiently track it. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can note, in fact, that the best place to find and destroy a submarine is in port, and that the further out to sea, the more complicated and expensive the task becomes. So submarine remains an asymmetric set. The fundamentals have not changed. But there, is, there are also many modern reasons that can explain the, this current demand for submarine forces. Freedom of the seas is now a global given since the Montego Bay Conference and gives a huge advantage to those fortunate to possess a blue water navy. The immense room to maneuver that oceans provides affords the collection of intelligence, the ability to posture, but also influence and project from the sea. The submarine is more useful than ever in this regard. Firstly, while surface units are increasingly traceable by satellites, a well-driven submarine is immune to this form of detection, allowing the political level the freedom to escalate or not a crisis response. And secondly, because the modern submarines have the means to project considerable, considerable power or force, alongside the obvious ballistic nuclear missiles, you have the cruise missiles with a range of over 1,000 kilometers, which can strike targets across the littoral, where 80% of the world's resources are found. Furthermore, furthermore, some submarines also have the capability to discreetly launch and recover teams of special forces. The submarine, whose levels of mobility, versatility, and stealth are getting better and better, is more than ever not only a very potent weapon, but also a deeply political tool. This is why, taking into account the manpower, industrial, and financial investment that they imply, they must be suited to the strategic requirements of the state that want them. A regional power with a coastline on an island sea will clearly not have the same submarine needs as the US Navy, for example. For the French Navy, our very large economic exclusive zone and our interest overseas requires obviously long range submarines. I think it is something we share with the Australian Navy. So your Navy, and in particular your submarine force, is linked to your geography and your world interests. I think it's, it's crucial. Now, from the French point of view, what is our experience? We have operated submarines for a very long time. There is a futile debate over whether the French, the British, or the Americans invented the modern submarine. We had the same debate for the aviation. <laughs> But anyway, anyway, we have a, a long understanding of the submarine, sometimes making bad choices and experiencing failure, but also with great successes, all of which gives us a solid industrial base with a personal and operational understanding that is particularly valuable. The driving force behind the knowledge was for us the creation of, the, of our nuclear deterrent force at sea. It was a huge industrial and human challenge that restructured and continues to dominate the organization of our submarine forces and also, in part, our Navy. 
maintaining a credible continuous at sea deterrence of three SSBNs during the Cold War demanded enormous feats of secrecy, reliability, security, education, and training. What is interesting to note now is how, with our experience of previous submarines, with the evolution of the strategic context, and at least the financial constraints, we have arrived at our current force of four SSBNs and six SSNs. At the end of the 1960s, we had around 25 diesel class submarines, and we needed to generate a force of six SSBNs, the Rudutab class that you have an example here. Our last class of conventional submarines, the Agosta class, allowed us to create commonalities with our first SSBNs, notably in ship control and the tactical weapon system, combat system. Later, during the 1970s, we developed our first class of SSN, the Ruby class, which came into service between 1982 and 1992, and all six of which remain in service today. It was experience gained from the first class of SSBNs and previously from the Agosta that made the Ruby, in which I spent 10 years of my life, such a success. They have been continually upgraded, notably the sonar, based on operational feedback, and we still use them for the full spectrum of submarine operations, anti-surface, anti-submarine, working with the CARA group, intelligence gathering, and special operations. During the 1980s, we had to develop the replacement for the, for the Rodotab class of SSBN. And with the Cold War still dominating, the Triomphant class were designed with every possible improvement to guard against detection, but also with increased science speed, depth capability, and sensors. These technological gems were the product of the experience of previous programs, but also a very strong political will. Yes, they were expensive, but they allowed us for advances in our shipbuilding industry as well as increased collective knowledge. We are still reaping these benefits today. I will come back to this later. In the 1990s, uh, the majority of NATO allies wanted to realign following the end of the Cold War, the so-called uh, um, peace dividend, and restructure their forces. In this context, it was decided to reformat the French submarine flotilla to four SSBN instead of six, and to six SSNs instead of, two attack of 12 attack submarines. So the Agostas were progressively withdrawn from service, and their missions, notably special operations were taken on by the SSNs who successfully added this, this string to their bow. This downsizing was not without consequence in the personnel domain. With 10 submarines, even with two crews, you swiftly anchored uh, program, problems of achieving a critical mass, particularly in small but highly specialized trades. Despite the end of the Cold War, submarine missions have never been so numerous and varied. And not having three or four SSNs at sea for many reasons was not an option. This forced us to look hard at recruitment, training, and retention of our submariners. I will come back to this also. Turning to the present, I'm getting to the core of my presentation. Where we are today and what choices have we made? The size and shape of our submarine flotilla has not changed since 1996. It remains four SSBNs and six SSNs. And was confirmed in the last two defense white papers of 2008 and 2013. While the defense budget has been constrained and the structure and manpower of every other element of the armed forces has been significantly reduced, that the famously expensive submarine force has not been touched 
speaks loudly. But it is not a coincidence. In my opinion, this is due to the combination of two major factors. First, proof of the requirement through operational success by both the Navy and the joint level, which is also recognized at the political level. The delivery of unbroken continuous at sea deterrence requires four SSBNs. The Royal Navy has come exactly to the same conclusion. And the need to have three SSNs deployed to fulfill past and current missions and operations justifies a squadron of six. Second, control of the cost of acquisition and running our submarines, without which, irrespective of their operational utility, we would lose the confidence of both the joint headquarters, who had arbitrated uh, in our favor, and the political level. This is obviously more important in times of budget restrictions like today. I will illustrate this vital second point with two examples from current experience, notably the upkeep of our Ruby class today and the building program of our future Barracuda class SSNs. For our current SSNs, we have broadly managed to stabilize maintenance costs. At the moment, it's uh, per year 142 billion euros. That means uh, about 210 million dollar, uh, Australian dollars for everything except uh, the nuclear core. Whilst we maintain an availability of the squadron of uh, 1,200 days a year at sea. This is a result of over a decade of permanent and iterative cooperation between the First, the submarine force headquarters. Second, the fleet support organization, which comprise uh, half naval officers and half procurement engineer, engineers, and which is in charge uh, with the setting of the maintenance contracts. And third, the industry itself. This demands a permanent and complex dialogue to find the best possible compromise between security requirements, maintaining operational availability and cost. Does the submarine really, really need to sail at 100% operational capacity given its forthcoming mission? It will be twice as expensive to do the work now than if I wait one month until the next port visit where the required spare part will be available and will not need to be robbed from another boat. At a time when maintenance costs tend only to increase, and for the domain of aviation, it's particularly true, and budgets are decreasing, this balance of cost versus need is absolutely essential. Without this, if you do not maintain your ships sufficiently, boats will either have to stay alongside with the vicious circle of fewer operations, less motivation for the crews, and less confidence in the submarine capability, or if you, were, if you waste your money for over, over maintenance, you reduce the chances of getting new submarines. Turning to these new submarines, you will be aware that we have a current built program for new SSNs called the Barracuda class. The first three of which are in construction in Cherbourg, in Normandy, and the first of which, the Suffren, will enter into service in 2017. Here, too, we, has, we have had to compromise. The need for six boats was repeatedly and rigorously demonstrated, as well as the necessary operational requirements. Increased silent speed in all sea water temperatures, cruise missile capability, greater special operations capacity. But the budget allocated to such an ambitious project, the budget is around 9 billion euros, that means 14 billion Australian dollars, has had to be tightly controlled from the start to avoid risk to see both the numbers and the crucial capabilities reduced. We are largely there thanks to the permanent dialogue between Navy, the procurement agency, and our industrial partners to arrive 
at sensible decisions based on the real operational need. To achieve this, you need firstly to listen to the feedback from operational and industrial experience to determine the minimum finance levels required and then to make choices about what really is essential. Uh, for example, the choice between uh, top anti torpedo decoys against greater speed and a deeper dive limit. You also need to avoid reinventing the wheel by learning from innovations of previous classes. In so doing, the considerable investment in the triumphant class of SSBN is benefiting the Barracuda and also the Scorpions, who in turn will have some transferable elements to the Barracuda. This permanent linkage between industry and the users, but also the presence of an active, broader technological and defense industry base, which is in France driven by the demands of the deterrent, has allowed us to successfully run this large project without the price exploding. The result is, uh, yes, the result is a 5,000 ton submarine that would not go quite as deep uh, and as fast as a Triomphant, but will have the same acoustic qualities, the same tactical combat systems, will be equipped with torpedoes, exocet and cruise missiles, is perfectly adapted to special operations with a greater maneuverability and the possibility to be fitted with a dry dock shelter and carry 15 commandos. While it will not be a Virginia class, for which our dreams and our wallets would not quite match, <laughs> it will nevertheless be a very efficient submarine that meets our ambitions and ambitions and our uh, operational objectives. So coming to my conclusion, if I could sum up to the necessary conditions for a sure and credible submarine force in six sentences, I would say that following. First, determine and justify your real operational needs in order to make the right decisions for the right target you require numbers and capabilities, just enough and not too much. Second, build and maintain something, submarine, operationally effective to ensure a good return on your investment and also operational advantage. And that will be attractive to personnel. Three, control costs, both for acquisition and upkeep, and upkeep over the, long, over the long term. Force, have a robust organization, Navy, Joint Headquarters, procurement, able to make the right capability-based decisions balanced with value for money. Five, have a sustainable defense industry able to collaborate seamlessly, openly for the long term, with active research and development supported at the highest level and with the ability to absorb lessons from previous classes of submarine and also current operational feedback. With frank and honest dialogue on technological and financial limits against the, against the desired capabilities. And last but not least, train and operate intelligently, efficiently in various demanding environments across the full spectrum of operations, including with the other services, to build credibility with political and military authorities, and as importantly, to motivate the crews who without which you have nothing. In sum, it is about a virtuous circle of dialogue and cooperation between the operators and the contractors that demand experience, honesty, but above all, continuity. It is because we are happy with this current balance we have in our summer in force today that I wanted to share this experience with you today. Thank you very much. Well, Admiral, thank you very much. And I think those uh, six points are actually very useful and 
well worth uh, dwelling on, actually, as, as, we, uh, as the conference proceeds. Now, colleagues, I suggest that what we do is allow our second presenter to speak before we take uh, questions. So please work all, uh, welcome Colonel Nyong to the stage. Well, Admiral Sawyer told you that uh, I was uh, worried yesterday night. Uh, that was yesterday night. Now I'm terrified. Okay, when you, you see, when you have two excellent uh, presentations from two admirals before you, a colonel ought to be very worried. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to keep up. Uh, it's going to be an uphill task, but I'll try my best. You know, previous distinguished speakers have spoken on the roles of submarine in maritime strategies. And over the next few sessions, we'll be hearing more on the management of submarine projects, lessons learned, and choices to be made when acquiring submarines. At this juncture, I seek your indulgence to allow me to take a detour and touch on a subject that is totally different. But in the Republic of Singapore Navy's perspective, a capability that is closely intertwined with building a submarine capability and making all the associated choices and trade-offs. I would like to share with you the RSN's experiences and the choices that we have made in developing a submarine escape and rescue. Small in short capability, a capability which we believe will make a difference in the unfortunate event that the worst case scenario of a distressed submarine do occur, especially when the deep sub is at a depth reachable by res submarine rescue vehicles. We believe as navies develop their respective submarine capabilities, a parallel development in building up some form of submarine rescue ability be it individually or collectively, is necessary. Over the past decade, the RSN Submarine Force has gained much operational experience through participation in various internal, bilateral, and multilateral exercises, a number of which are SMER related. The knowledge and experience gained reinforce the RSN's fundamental belief in the need to build a viable organic submarine rescue capability to have the ability to respond swiftly to any sub contingencies There are generally two options one can gain access to submarine rescue capability. One obvious option is for the Navy to raise and own its organic submarine rescue assets. While the other option is to leverage on partner navies with existing rescue capability through bilateral arrangements such as a memorandum of agreement both options have their benefits. Establishing an MOA with a partner Navy would certainly promote mutual understanding and more importantly, deepen relationship between the two navies, while at the same time, avoiding the need to raise and maintain a submarine rescue capability of its own. On the other hand, having organic assets would allow faster response and coordination in the event of a submarine incident and reduce the need to rely on external counterparts. Now, in order to have an organic rescue capability, one approach is to raise it within the Navy, which requires heavy investment on the part of the Navy to commit time and manpower. Another approach would be to outsource by leveraging on available commercial expertise and, res and resources. Suitable mechanism could be inc incorporated into the arrangement for the Navy to retain command and control over the capability. Our quest to acquire a submarine rescue capability began in 2005, when we started conceptualizing and exploring various options. Due to our lack of experience and expertise in human in submarine rescue at that point, the RSN was forced to thoroughly examine all possible options and their associated challenges. After careful consideration, it was then decided to embark on a commercially owned, commercially operate approach, rather than to raise a new naval capability. This approach has proven to be more cost effective and less resource intensive, both from the manpower and training perspective. The vision of having our own submarine rescue system was realized in 2009 through the integration of submarine support vessel, MV Swift Rescue, 
and submissible submarine rescue vessel, this search and res rescue six, also known as DSA six. In our case, a public private collaboration arrangement was established with First Response Marine S Services, which in itself, a partnership between Singapore Technologies Marine, the ship designer and builder, and James Fisher Defence, the submarine rescue expert that designed and built DSA 6 and now maintains and operates the submarine rescue payloads on board MV Swift Rescue. To crew and sail MV Swift Rescue, First Response Marine engaged the services of Swire Pacific Offshore, an established entity in offshore marine industry. Finally, the RSN augments MV Swift Rescue with a RSN underwater medical team to operate re the recompression chambers and medical facilities on board, as well as a four-man crew, including the officer commanding to command and control the ship's missions. This public-private collaboration arrangement between the RSN and the above-mentioned private entities provided the RSN with a holistic submarine rescue capability and benefited the RSN in three ways. Firstly, it has allowed us access to the highly specialized field of submarine rescue through James Fisher Defense while leveraging on the ship construction capability of Singapore Technologies Marine to view MV Swift Rescue. Secondly, it is a cost and manpower effective means of achieving a, a reliable rescue service without taxing the already lean manpower within the RSN. And thirdly, it has enabled the rapid build-up of an organic submarine rescue capability for the RSN four years from conceptualization to operationalization. Do allow me to briefly introduce you to MV Swift Rescue, a ship that possesses a wide range of capabilities to conduct small operations. The vessel is equipped with all necessary systems to conduct an effective rescue. There are the launch and recovery systems, transfer under pressure chamber, helipad, ROVs, and an integrated navigation and tracking system. Coupled with the dynamic positioning system, the vessel is capable of launching DSA 6 within 15 minutes upon arrival at the scene of DSA. Together with its two 20 packs recompression chambers and eight bedded high dependency ward, the rescue submariners will be triad and attended to by medical personnel specially trained in hyperbaric and diving medicine. This fully integrated system is able to operate 28 days at sea continuously and conduct rescue operations to depth of 500 meters, even at harsh sea conditions of up to sea state five. The capabilities of MV Sea Rescue has been validated through various internal exercises and participation in SMER related exercises such as Exercise Pacific Ridge, where live meetings are, were conducted between regional Navy submarine rescue vessels and simulated DSAPs. The DSAR 6 has successfully conducted 178 meetings with submarines and training meeting plates to date. Beyond building a submarine rescue capability, the RSN strongly believes in the need to build and maintain a strong network for multilateral submarine rescue collaboration as more countries in the region acquire or enhance their submarine capabilities. To this end, the RSN's involvement towards promoting regional small collaboration include hosting and participating in exercises and professional forums, such as uh, Exercise Pacific Ridge, which I mentioned earlier, and the Asia Pacific Submarine Conference. This provided excellent platforms for participants to exchange ideas and experiences on SMA. The RSN also organized the inaugural submarine rescue course in 2012 to promote SMA knowledge among regional submarine operators. Over the last few years, the RSN has been working towards establishing bilateral submarine rescue arrangements with other submarine operating navies who operate in the region. Till date, the RSN has established such arrangements with the Indonesian Navy, Royal Australian Navy, and the Vietnam People's Navy. Safety of life at sea is paramount, 
and the urgency of a DSAP, as mentioned by Emerald Sawyer earlier, means that the importance of submarine rescue cannot be overemphasized. I have outlined the RSN approach and commitment towards building a submarine rescue capability and enhancing regional collaboration. We understand the importance of submarine rescue and multinational collaboration in SMA. The RSN is ready to join the larger SMA fraternity in a concerted and purposeful commitment towards the growth of submarine rescue in the region, while we all continue to make choices in submarine acquisitions. I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you. And I think we've heard uh, uh, some very interesting uh, presentations over the last um, hour or so which show the different national solutions which countries have put in place in order to develop um, uh, highly specialised and highly capable uh, uh, technologies. Um, so now we go to, uh, now we go to Q&A. Uh, what I would propose to do uh, firstly, uh, uh, because I'm here and because I can, is to exercise the moderator's right to ask um, a question of both our speakers first, just to get the ball rolling. And so to uh, uh, Vice Admiral Duché, I, I, I would like to ask about your perspectives on French cooperation on submarine matters with um, the US and the UK. Um, I, I think that's of interest to us because in some ways we perceive uh, a strong autonomous uh, capability development within the French system, but I'm interested to hear your views about, um, uh, in fact, the uh, capacity for international cooperation which has taken place. And uh, to Colonel Nyong, what I'd like to ask is about um, your perspective on uh, next steps on regional collaboration. Um, I can see that Singapore has already taken a number of important steps, for example, in building those bilateral relations um, uh, with Australia and Indonesia and um, uh, Vietnam. And I would be interested to hear your thoughts about, so how do we now take this forward thinking in regional terms about the uh, submarine uh, uh, rescue uh, capability? So why don't we start with those two questions and then I'll, I will throw to the audience for, uh, for questions from you. But um, Admiral Duchesne. <coughs> My question is not so simple. <laughs> Uh, of course, with the US and the UK, we share a lot of things since uh, the two world wars and since uh, the Cold War as well. And uh, as you know, uh, for a, a Blue Sea Navy to have carriers on the side and to have uh, nuclear submarines on the other side are the two pillars probably that we share, not at the same size, of course, uh, than the US, but that we share with the US and the UK. And uh, it, uh, it created a lot of links between us. Uh, I, more generally, I, I will come back to the summer winds after, but more generally, uh, for, an for, for the operations, we work 90% of our time with the US and the UK, especially for the French Navy in the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the Mediterranean Sea. But uh, for the for the particular UK French perspective, maybe you don't know that we have uh, at a political level signed uh, a treaty which is uh, the which name is Lancaster House Treaty, which is uh, surprising maybe for those who think that the British and the French will never uh, be uh, together. That's not that's completely stupid because we have no choice. Or in fact, we have a choice to die separately or to survive together. And we have preferred to survive together. <laughs> and so, in fact, we, we work very well with the British for that. And uh, the, the Lancaster House Treaty has two pillars. One is uh, to build together what we call a CGEF, Combined Joint Expeditionary Force, which is uh, joint. And the second pillar is to have uh, together a carrier group available. And, within the, and in this carrier group, uh, of course, the, 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 the British have uh, chosen uh, not the same aircraft that we have, I mean, without catapults, but it doesn't matter. We have decided that a nation gave the carrier and the planes and the fighters, but the, uh, the headquarters and the escort will be mixed. And in this escort, there is a submarine, for example. So you can have 
uh, a French carrier, Charles de Gaulle, with two French frigates, uh, two, uh, two uh, uh, British uh, frigates, and one British uh, submarine, or, or the opposite. Uh, so I come back now to submarines. Submarines, uh, it's uh, of course, maybe also because we, are, we have no more diesel class submarines, so we have only SSNs and SSBNs, and we collaborate essentially on the SSNs, but not only because uh, I can't say more for the operations, but for the industry, I think we will have, that's my, my personal opinion, we will have no choice for the, our next SSBNs. Uh, for us, it's, uh, we call it uh, uh, F-MOD, that means uh, future uh, mean of uh, deterrence. And for the UK, it is successor class. They, will not, they are not completely uh, at the same time, but uh, they are nearly at the same time, and I think we have to share more. If, you, if, I turn back to my, if I come back to my presentation, you have understood that even for deterrence, we have really to value for money. And, so, uh, and it's the same for the UK. And so I think we have to collaborate more, even if it is purely national, for a lot of equipment I think we can share. I, I'm thinking about the sonars, I'm thinking about some uh, different equipments or the combat systems, even for the pumps, for a lot of things. Not the, not the reactor, not the core, uh, but for a lot, a lot of things I think we can cooperate. So yes, we have a lot of cooperation, but yes, also we have more to do tomorrow. Admiral, thank you. Colonel. Yeah, I believe the question is uh, what uh, going forward, what will the RSN do to promote uh, regional cooperation? The, the fact is this, we are a very young Navy and even a younger submarine force. So the, we are just off the starting point right at this moment. And uh, going forward, I think our key focus and our key concern is to continue to participate in uh, regional uh, forums and exercises to promote a mutual understanding. And at the same time, working together with our partner navies, they will, uh, they will be interested to go into some sort of a collaboration with us because we see our rescue capability as uh, something that is uh, useful to the whole community. And in fact, I think we feel a, a void that's in our region. You know, if for Singapore, when you look around Singapore, we are one of the navy that has this capability and we are more than happy to offer this ability to, to the rest of the navy. Should they see value in this? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so we go to uh, Anthony Bergen, and then second question here. Uh, Anthony. <coughs> Thank you, Anthony Bergen from Ashby. And uh, two questions, firstly to the Colonel, and following Peter Jennings' question to you about next steps. I think one of the uh, things that we've all seen with MH370 is some of the problems of um, regional coordination when it comes to search and rescue. And maybe, and maybe I'm verbaling my uh, director here, but I thought where he was going with his question was that your centre could genuinely become a regional centre. Um, you know, those graphs that we saw of the uh, proliferation of submarines, there are going to be more accidents. Um, there will, will be, uh, I guess, missing submarines and in the worst case, uh, you know, a sunk submarine. Um, I also noticed on that uh, graph uh, in the last session the number of Chinese submarines. Um, I guess an obvious question lurking in there is whether you could bring China into such, a, uh, uh, such an arrangement. So that's my question really, you know, do you see your centre, um, which as you say, you've developed bilateral agreements, but uh, I thought where Peter was going with his question was perhaps could it be genuinely a regional centre. And my question to the Admiral, um, you're the first person I've heard at the conference actually talk about uh, submariners as part of the capability and one of your bullet points was as Australia goes forward to make our submarine service attractive to people to join. So any thoughts there from uh, the French experience in terms of uh, leveraging our uh, young people to, uh, to, to, uh, to go underwater. Okay. Well, uh, 
if you take the uh, Malaysian airline incident, I think shortly after the incident, we actually deployed uh, MV3 Rescue. So at the most tactical level, I think we do have the capability to, to help in uh, such an incident. At the operational level, over the last couple of years, we've been uh, building up uh, this center, what, what we call as, uh, what we name as the multi, multinational operation and exercise center. Okay, it is an outfit that is able to coordinate and uh, command and control uh, multinational uh, operations. So in terms of infrastructure, certainly we have uh, built up certain capabilities within the RSN to do that. As to the question on the regional submarine rescue ability, I think it all depends on whether regional navy finds a need and uh, firstly the need and secondly whether the willingness to, to enter into such an uh, uh, cooperation. No, we are certainly more than glad to do that. Thank you. Admiral Deschamps. <laughs> I have a first answer, but it's not politically correct. <laughs> no, it's just a joke. When you are, when you are, when you are aboard your submarines, you are without your family, if you want what I mean. <laughs> it's like a monastery. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not politically correct. No, to, to be frank, <laughs> to be frank, there is objective uh, reasons and uh, subjective reasons. Objective reasons is uh, extra, extra pay and extra advantages for your pension. That's the same for the Air Force and for the air Fleet Air Arm. So you are a little more paid aboard the submarine than on the surface ship, and you have also some advantages for your pension. But that's not enough, and, and in fact, it's not at all enough. The real reason why the submariners are happy is when their submarine works. And when their submarine are well used in interesting missions and uh, in varied missions. Uh, I, when, I, when I was a young submariner, we, I, uh, we, we have uh, some problems about the Ruby class at the beginning of maintenance, and I remember the crew was very unhappy. For, for, for a lot of persons, they said, but, but no, they are, they are at home it every, every, every evening, so they have to be happy. No, not at all. They were not happy because they wanted to have an interesting mission. And so I think it's really crucial to have a well-maintained submarine and a good submarine, because if at each exercise your submarine is, uh, is uh, uh, in a bad situation uh, against uh, your partner, your, your uh, what is the word for that? Uh, your, 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 the opposition of another submarine, you are very unhappy. So you need a good submarine and you, good, and you need also to a submarine which is uh, able to, to have the advantage. Uh, then really uh, to have various missions. If, if at each time the same the submarine does the same mission, uh, which, is, which could be boring for some times, it's a problem. So it's a, you know it's a it's a balance between the missions, between uh, the attractivity for the pay, for the attractivity for the uh, for the pension. It's a, it's a, it's a mixture, and I think it's the key of the success of your submarine forces. At the moment, we we have no problem of recruitment. The main the main problem is to the retention, because of the concurrence for some trades of the industry and of the companies. And so we have, uh, we have uh, built with some companies, for example, EDF, Electricité de France, uh, agreements to avoid that our submariners, as soon as they are trained and educated, uh, will be uh, picked by the, by the company. So we say, okay, it's a, it is a win-win ag uh, agreement. We educate, we train the submariners, especially in the uh, nuclear uh, topics, for example, and uh, after 17 years, they will be able to leave the Navy and you will have the advantage to have somebody uh, uh, well-trained and di directly use, uh, useful for the, for the company. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a permanent uh, action that we have to, to, uh, to, um, to manage inside of the Navy and outside of the Navy. I hope it ans it's, uh, answers your question. Thanks, Admiral. Now we had a question on the third row here. Yes, please. Uh, Chris Skinner, question for uh, Admiral Duchesne. 
Um, Admiral, you uh, concluded with six very important points that we should uh, consider. And the third of those was the controlling of costs through life of the submarine. And, and you had earlier mentioned in passing the uh, US Virginia class program, which uh, I'm sure you'd studied in, uh, in, in many ways. Uh, they also uh, had great attention to controlling costs of the construction program, but also the cost of operations. How, what, what's the secret of that from the French Navy's point of view of, you know, what are the, the key issues you have to deal with? I will be very frank with you. I think there is two programs of submarines which are models, Virginia class and uh, Barracuda class. All the other programs have exploded. All. You can, it's, it's completely opened. You can see in, the, in all the papers. Why? I think the US, but maybe uh, you, uh, Phil could, be, could answer better, but I think they had the, the experience of the Seawolf class which was a, little, who was a little like our Triomphant class. It, nothing was too beautiful, you know? Nothing was too beautiful. <laughs> and then, because, you, because the US needed, uh, I don't remember the target, but uh, 50 or 50 submarines, it was completely impossible to afford a target of 50 Seawolf. And so they, go, they, they went to the same conclusion that we, were, we, 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 we had, that we, you need to be less ambitious, or not to be less ambitious, but to have the right ambition. And all our work during the 10 or 12, well, 12 last years were, were just, were, were to be, uh, was to be uh, accurate with our ambition. And that demands uh, a permanent dialogue with industry. Uh, I will give you an example. If you ask for a submarine, uh, let's say 20, 25 knots maximum speed. You ask that and, and the industry will say, okay, it's possible. But the industry will maybe not say, uh, not tell you that if you have 24 knots submarines, you will pay uh, half. Why? Because between 24 and 27, you double the, 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 the propulsion power, you know? But the, so there, there is a gap, for example, at 24. And if you know that 24, in fact, you pay half, you will accept to have 24. If you don't know that, you will, you will pay for 25. In fact, you will have 27, but you have asked for 25. And so it's very important to have, you know, the limits where you, the, where you, where you have a gap between two, uh, uh, between two systems. And that demands, really, confidence honesty between the industry and the, and the user and the Navy. And that's what we did with the help of the procurement during the last 10, 12 years for the Barracuda. Because uh, I, I, this morning I have heard a lot about the target of the Australian submarine force, the 12. For us, the six are completely demonstrated because it's very simple to understand. We need a submarine in the Atlantic Ocean. We need a submarine in the uh, Mediterranean Sea and we need a submarine in the Indian Ocean. And it is very difficult to have three submarines deployed without having six submarines in, in your target. So the six submarines are not an option. We need six submarines. But if we were in the same uh, mind that we have built the Triomphant, we, be pr we have probably four or three submarines for the same price. Because if your uh, budget explodes, that means that the other programs of the armed forces will be reduced. And so you have enemies everywhere. Inside of the Navy, because that means less frigates, uh, less MPAs, uh, and so on. And outside of the Navy, in the Air Force and in the, uh, in the Army. So it's really crucial, crucial, essential, to maintain your cost. I think it's, uh, it's no, no more an option. You have to maintain your cost. Of course, those problems would never happen uh, here, Admiral. Um, <laughs> any, any, any further questions? Yes, please, Mark. Thank you very much. I've got a question for the Admiral. Um, I've got to say, very impressive program that, that France has in terms of building submarines and building submarines efficiently. What I'm interested in is, in terms of industrial organisation, how you manage to, um, 
I, I guess, maintain the continuity so that you can build from one successive generation to the other. I'm wondering how important the French export programs are in maintaining the viability of the French submarine industrial base. That's a very clever question. <laughs> very clever question. Uh, I, 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 I tried to demonstrate that, in fact, the, 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 all the programs are, you know, I don't know if the English was overlapped. There is a, you know, a, uh, we have not a, a program, then we stop, then we have another program. It's very important to maintain uh, uh, this continuity, but more than a continuity, because Let's take the example of the Barracuda, because I know a little bit of the Barracuda program. We have a lot of improvement, uh, improvements of the Triomphant, but also some from the Scorpions. And the Scorpion was built to maintain the competences of the, of the dockyard. Not of the dockyard, of the research and technology uh, uh, part of the dockyard. And so it's critical to have like you say, uh, a continuity. And it, it is also critical to, um, to, uh, to have a procurement able to fulfill, if necessary, the research and development uh, of some uh, companies which are in a situation where they, they have nothing to do during the, the 10 or, or, the, or not the 10, but the two or three next years. And so that's the, the role of DGA, which is the French DMO, is to uh, afford to the company some, uh, we, we spent, I think it's one billion dollars uh, a year for research and development in France. Uh, again, it's probably uh, one of the drivers is deterrence, but not only. <coughs> and, and DGA is in charge of that. And DGA is very careful to, to, to verify that we will not lose uh, one competence during a gap of two or three years between two, two, pro two projects. But you're right, if we need to export Scorpion, it, is, it was because we needed to, uh, to maintain competences. But the advantage is that uh, the Scorpion take the benefit also, uh, the Scorpion or the Scorpion is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family of submarines, it's not a submarine. But this submarine we try to export, the benefit of all the competences of the nuclear submarines. And so it's, uh, it's a double benefit. It's a benefit for the nuclear submarines to have some, uh, uh, some new technologies uh, experiment uh, on the Scorpion class, and it is for the Scorpion, the benefit is to, to have all the, the, the money we, did, we spent for the nuclear submarines uh, in, a, in, a, um, in, the, in the improvements. So I, I agree, uh, we, I think we, ha we are quite happy with this, uh, with this system today, but it is still fragile. Fragile or fragile, I don't know. And it's, it's, uh, we have to be very careful, and it is, it is really the job of the DGA for that. And uh, I think, uh, at the moment, uh, the, the, the job is going well. I think for the Barracuda, we are very happy. Another point I want to mention is my last photograph, I, I was very fast for the last photograph, but my last photograph shown, shown the Barracuda, uh, uh, control room and uh, and I think which is very important is to have a, a, a shipyard with a capacity of integration in a three dimension uh, because I have visited uh, I, 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 if you have the time to go to Cherbourg you have to visit Cherbourg you can move in, in the submarine exactly when a, a submarine is, is not completely finished but you can move in virtual in the virtual world in the submarine, you can touch everything. You can move the, the, different, pre the different pieces. You can uh, organize your submarine when you want. If you are 182, meet, uh, 182 centimeters like me, you put a main of 182 centimeters, uh, and, and I move with, this, with my high. And, and so it's very important to maintain this capability of integration. And for that, it's a very important investment we did for the SSBNs. And we have the, ret uh, the return on investment on all the submarines we, we do uh, because of this, uh, of this investment of the three-dimension di virtual uh, system. And so uh, it's not very complicated uh, to, uh, to put an equipment of a scorpion 
about the Barracuda because you can, you know, you can maneuver uh, in virtually uh, the different piece of the submarine inside the submarines. And so this uh, exchanges between the different kinds of submarines are very, now I think are very efficient in Cherbourg. I, I invite you to visit that. It's very, very uh, interesting to, to discover. And I was, as a user, I was really convinced. Well, thank you, Admiral. I think approximately 200 people will take up your invitation <laughs> to, to visit Schoberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, two, uh, I think, important takeaways that I uh, take from this session is that uh, you can dream of having the Virginia class, but if your wallet doesn't stretch that far, it's important to have the right level of ambition. Um, uh, you, you don't need to be a nuclear engineer to know that, even though Admiral Deshaies actually is, but I think that is a useful, useful lesson. And, and, and from the Colonel, um, something really interesting was the emphasis on the public-private partnership and the speed with which it was possible for that capability to be developed. Four years, that's the difference between the 2009 white paper and where we're at now. Uh, that's a pretty impressive achievement, I think, in that, in that space of time. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we've, um, I'm going to give you an extra uh, 10 minutes for, uh, for coffee. You had 10 minutes less for lunch. Can you please organise to be back in the room promptly a little before 1600? And can you please thank our two speakers?